it's not a great start because I have to start with an apology, I'm afraid, that <coughs> Caroline Rayner from Costing Scouser isn't here because she's been shortlisted for uh, Women in Construction and Engineering Award and is being grilled um, in an interview in London as we speak. Um, so um, good luck to her. Um, we hope it goes well, but um, we've got her contribution um, lined up, so I'm afraid you'll have to listen to me for a little bit, a little bit longer on that. But um, but but projecting Caroline and, uh, and and the integration of archaeology with with construction. So what we wanted to do with this little case study is is just look at how um, we talk an awful lot about better integration of archaeology into the construction process, um, earlier consultation with archaeologists as part of construction uh, projects in the planning process. Um, and we wanted to have a look at a case study of what that actually might mean and what the benefits of that are in terms of benefits for archaeology, um, but also benefits for uh, the construction teams and the construction process. And probably the bit that gets left out most of all is the benefits for the archaeologists themselves um, who, are, who are working on site. Um, I'm delighted that, um, that Kat Gibbs is here from MOLA um, who can speak with great authority on that point. Um, the, the messages from CIFA's point of view um, that archaeology adds value to industry and to society are ones that we, that we talk about a lot and you will have heard us talk about a lot. Um, if you have copies of our client guide um, then that's the message that we've been trying to promote very strongly over the years um, to the client sector bodies, to the professional associations and the trade associations that represent um, the construction industry. And one of the things that we've been trying to introduce, and I hope it'll come back into our discussions later on when we talk about what makes the ideal archaeologist, is this idea that if archaeology isn't adding value, to industry and to society, if it's not delivering public benefit, then it's inherently not being done to a professional standard. That should be enshrined right from our code of conduct through the standards and guidance and every piece of good practice guidance that, that we produce or collaborate um, with others to produce. Um, if we're not delivering a benefit for the public, then, then we aren't fulfilling our duty as, as professionals. And um, those of you who were here at the opening address will have, will have heard this already, but this isn't something that, this is something that we've been talking about for a, for, for a long time, and sometimes what feels like quite a frustratingly long time. Um, so back to uh, 2011 and the publication of the, the Southport report, and actually back to the, the conference session um, at Southport, for those of you um, without long memories, that's why it's called the Southport Report, in case, in case you ever wondered, and that's, that's too, too long ago. It was a conference session, at the IFA conference as was, um, in Southport, uh, just after the publication of PPS5, um, where a group of professionals, a group of individuals um, in the sector came together to anticipate the benefits and the, the, the potential for greater progress in delivering uh, public benefit that that change in, in planning um, planning guidance um, offered us. Obviously that was a, a short-lived piece of guidance and it was and it was England specific uh, but the principles of the Southport report and the recommendations I think still hold true um, and they were echoed uh, in 2015 uh, with a slightly different focus in the client guide that we produced um, trying to promote these messages to, to the client sector and trying to stimulate from the client side, more of a demand, asking them to expect more of their archaeologists than just delivering um, fulfilment of a planning condition or, or design of a, of a scheme of, of uh, mitigation. Um, when we came to review the Southport report as part of another project that was funded by Historic England, um, the conclusions of that review were that, that a lot of those recommendations still held true. And whilst good progress had been made in some areas, there's still a lot of work to be done to enshrine the delivery of public benefit into the everyday work that we do. So not just on the exceptional projects, not just on the huge infrastructure scale projects, but in that bread and butter um, work that, uh, that, that, that most, most archaeological companies do 
most of the time. And actually the recommendations that the 21st Century Challenges uh, for Archaeology project made are very similar and echo the Southport recommendations. Um, and there is a sense of, of, that we're saying the same things over and over again and we're not necessarily seeing um, seeing the changes that, that we'd hoped for. Um, and before you think that's, that's too gloomy a, a, an assessment, ch change is, is often um, incremental and we don't necessarily perceive it at the time. So we may look back in the future and think we've done more um, than we have, but where the, the um, introduction of PPS5 was seen as a catalyst and something that might actually just change us direction altogether, um, we've had to work that much harder um, without it. So the vision that the Southport report um, produced um, the, 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 the aspiration um, was for a different sort of archaeological work where public involvement and participation was, was built in from the start, where research aims were explicit and not buried away somewhere. The research word wasn't being treated as a, as a, as a, a dirty secret. The sector's dirty secret that we mustn't let the construction industry know that that's what we're actually doing. Um, and that the use and, and value of the archive uh, was more widely recognised and integrated at the beginning of the project. And that altogether this would provide a much greater value um, to the, the property and development sector. Um, so the message is that, that from a CIFA point of view that we've been trying to communicate to uh, the client's side, to the developers, um, is all about integrating archaeology at a much earlier stage to deliver something more than, than, than the piece of paper that allows the, the development to proceed. And it's about placemaking and design. It's about um, enhancing cultural value, about community cohesion. A lot of the things that, that the, the case studies that our colleagues were talking about before the lunch break um, were highlighting about that added value that, that archaeology can bring to, um, to a project. And not forgetting the contribution to knowledge. And I think quite often when we talk about public benefit, we focus very much on community engagement, which is one very valuable and useful side of, of public benefit. But we shouldn't forget that the creation of knowledge in itself is a public benefit um, and an enhancement of, of understanding the research dividend. Um, on the other side of that, then, is, is of what value that is to, to the developers, to the clients. How do we, how do we translate that into, into a language that makes sense to them so that we're not talking entirely at, at, at cross-purposes? And, and we talk a lot about the, the PR value and the corporate social responsibility value of engaging with communities, particularly on those, on those developments that are potentially controversial. Um, and where there's an anticipation of, of, uh, of, of community um, hostility or, or backlash to, to change. Um, how far these messages get through is, is another matter. We, we did a, an interesting um, survey of our registered organisations about how much they use the client guide and whether they actually, whether they actually use it with their clients. Um, and... and we found that, that quite a small number of them were actually using that information or referring their clients to it. Um, but when we asked them what the messages were that they would like us to be presenting to their client sector, they were exactly the messages in the client guide. So that, that material exists and it's, it's there um, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's what we would like um, to be working with our registered organisations to be able to, to, to deliver more, more effectively. And one of the projects, and having, having said that, that these are, these are um, messages that we would like to enshrine and embed within all projects, the case study inevitably is, is the biggest one going at the moment. Um, the the uh, HS2 work in uh, Sir St James's Gardens in, in Euston. Um, we had an opportunity, um, thanks to an invite from Caroline Rayner, to come down and and have a day on site, uh, uh, myself and a, a couple of CIFA colleagues, to come and talk to, to staff, to do a little bit of CIFA recruitment and a little bit of Q&A on site, but also to talk to the engineering uh, and landscape teams there, um, which, was a, which was a fantastically useful day from, from our point of view, not, not least because we got to get out of the office and, and, and see a little bit of archaeology for a change. Um, 
but Caroline Caroline's written about um, about that that greater integration and and if you'll forgive me I'm, I'm just going to re read this because I can't I can't deliver it um, authentically as, as, as she would have done um, but she was talking a lot about about engineering and archaeology construction and, and, and archaeology as being mutually uh, dependent disciplines um, and she says engineering and archaeology as disciplines have different drivers and different perspectives and desires but both groups need each other to successfully develop and deliver projects and without construction there'd be very limited scope um, these days for large-scale archaeological excavation and investigation and without the archaeological mitigation, many developments would never make it out of the planning stages. Um, and despite often being viewed as an obstruction or a potential cause of delay, perceptions are beginning to shift. So at HS2's enabling works contract in Area South, Costain Scanska JV is carrying out archaeological work well in advance of the main construction phase, permitting a targeted and specific approach to the works without concern for major programme delay. So she says an excellent case in point is the work at St James's Gardens in Euston where 40,000 burials are currently being archaeologically excavated to permit the creation of the new Euston station. And the works at St James's Garden represent a project of unparalleled complexity in terms of the engineering and design works uh, which have allowed the, the excavation to take place. So on the site there, they have engineered for archaeology um, on an unprecedented and unique scale by using in-house archaeological know-how, engineered design and pre-planning to solve the archaeological issues. Um, and she talks a little bit about the, the, the encapsulation structure, which, which Kat might be able to say a little bit more about um, later on. So the structure not only fulfills stakeholder requirements, but is environmentally sustainable and also maximises the potential for a safe, efficient and groundbreaking archaeological excavation in central London. By blending archaeology and construction and taking a more open-minded approach to managing groups, which have traditionally been regarded as non-standard construction functions, she says we can improve productivity, increase understanding and work to more cost-effective and efficient outcomes. And this is evidence at St James's Garden, where the initial planned outputs by the archaeological teams have now been increased fivefold through the introduction of engineering initiatives and innovations, such as small electric and hybrid plants to reduce hand digging and mitigate manual handling risks. Again, Kat might be able to say more about that. Just scribbling notes. So she, she concluded by saying that archaeology is often overlooked as the contractor's best route to inexpensive yet valuable community engagement. And obviously um, there are a few sites that are, that are more controversial at the moment than, than, than HS2 potentially. As construction contractors, the demolition of a building or the diversion of a utility does not often spark the public imagination. Yet archaeology is a great tool for engaging with the public and local community. And by allowing the archaeologists to actively promote the work's findings and engage people in understanding the human story, the journey for the construction teams inevitably becomes easier. Archaeology can and should be viewed as a potential plus point with many positive outputs if it's managed and planned in an integrated fashion. And championing and supporting archaeological works promotes a sense of inclusivity, establishes educational and academic credentials, and exhibits a willingness to share knowledge. It can also act as a focal point creating new bonds or links within the community within which we're working. Um, and there are a huge number of positive benefits which shouldn't be underestimated. And it'll be interesting to come back, I think, um, at the end of that project and at the end of different aspects of the HS2 um, work to see how effective that engagement was. Um, and to see, as part of, of, of the evaluation, whether whether the construction site teams are included in that, in that evaluation um, process to, to gauge the extent to which their embracing of archaeology and archaeologists has perhaps changed or their, their capacity, willingness to, to do that. I can't answer questions on Caroline's behalf. Um, so at this point, I will hand over to Kat to tell us a little bit more about whether that integration has delivered greater value for the archaeologists on site. So, as is my usual form, I have failed to prepare. 
very much <laughs> with regards to this because yet again I agreed to do it in a moment of inattention and then forgot all about it. So I did run around the site um, and ask a few of my colleagues what they thought, um, the innovations, how they've come across, how they've enjoyed them, has it worked and their opinions because I think I've worked for Mola for six and a half years. The bulk of that work has been in London. On top of that, the bulk of that work has been in burial ground sites. So my perception of this site is clearly going to be very different to those people that we're taking on as part of the joint venture with MHI um, with Headland. They've come from rural backgrounds, very varied backgrounds, and haven't done anything like this before. So I'm going to defer to them a little bit about how they perceived it working or not working, as the case may be. From various points of view, I'm just going to let you go back two years ago now when we, when we started um, the project. We actually had running a couple of volunteer outreach projects going on. We had a group of volunteers that were in the archives for us and they started the digitisation of the burial records. And because that was a set project for a set number of weeks, it obviously didn't manage to do all of them. Um, I think in the register, there are over 61,000 burials, not all of which are at Euston, um, but that's a lot of, it's a lot of register <laughs> to go through. Um, but that's been really useful um, on site um, because we actually now can see sort of where a lot of where a lot of people might be within the ground. We've actually got the plots for them and where they might be, which is really nice on site for us. Um, the second project that we had, um, we had some volunteers in helping us, well, quite a lot of volunteers, helping us doing um, the recording of some uh, ex situ, so we moved around gravestones, which again was really nice to get other yeah, sort of people from, from the local community involved in helping us do that. But from an archaeological perspective, from an archaeologist perspective, it was really nice because the archaeologists got to work with them to get that data, to have that data. And as far as the archaeologists are concerned, more importantly, we now have a donut list of named individuals. And the way that works is we have the list of, of individuals uh, named on the marker stones, and then when we find them in the ground, we get donuts. So there's always value <laughs> in data. Um, so that's kind of from the front of the sort of including sort of volunteers and, and work on site. But also a lot of those, a lot of these things, especially the recording, the, the, the things that would take place post-ex. So we do the work on site and then this research and this will be done post-ex and we'd never be involved. And it's, and it's you know, all that late data will be found later, whereas now it's kind of an ongoing and it runs together. So that's really quite nice for us. We go, oh yeah, we know more about these people. So it's nice little interesting stories we have on a daily, if not you know, weekly basis. When it comes to being on site, there are a lot of people. And again, from my background, that's, that's not something un unusual. I've spent 13 years in London with various projects and all of the sites that I'm on are demolition or early construction projects. And I'm very used to sharing the sites with multiple other contractors. I think on Euston at the minute, we have what, six, seven different contractors um, none of which are identifiable from the other. We're all in very attractive orange. Um, and the only way you can kind of tell which company they're from is on their back. So we decided it was really important right from the start, right from the first day on site, that we discussed just, yeah, like who, who was who and what they did. So that we have the guys from Palmer's and the lovely brother, and they're, they're the chaps that have built the encapsulation structure. Tent. Don't call it a tent. It's encapsulated through it. But they're, they're building that and they're maintaining that and they've got crews. So we, yes, yeah, so we know that they do. We have um, TCS, who are the exhumation company. And it's important that everybody knows what they do because they are doing exactly the same job as us, but without the paperwork. <laughs> so it's good that everyone kind of knows what it is. Um, and then we have the attendance BCL that are assisting us. And so it, it's, it's really important to be clear who's doing what, who's responsible for what, and who you go to when you need something fixing or amending. And I think that's really important for the archaeologists to know, but also for the other contractors to know who's doing what and why they're doing it. And also within the archaeology, archaeology teams, who does what. So we also put together a presentation about within the archaeology team, who does what. So we've got the surveyors that are doing this and, and so on and so forth. So that when someone's doing something, everyone, can, everyone will know 
who they are and what they're doing. So I think sort of being very clear about roles and responsibilities is a big part of, of, of making the site work. Wasn't um, a lot of stuff people fed back to me about kind of what has worked is around the health and safety aspects of what we're doing. There are meetings every afternoon and supervisors or project uh, and sort of the site manager from, from all of the teams go to those and they're very clear uh, about what they plan to do the next day. And then that's what forms our daily briefings um, in the morning. So we got told in, we get told in the morning, every morning, exactly what, who's doing what, which obviously has huge implications because although the site is large, there is a lot of plant going on, there are a lot of different activities going on, there are a lot of deliveries coming in, there's lots of um, muckaways going out, there's a lot of soil being removed, and it's just so everyone knows what's going on. But it also means you, you, you know what should be happening, so that when something else is happening, you can react to that, you can flag it, or you can kind of question exactly what's going on. So it's really good. Things like walkways moving a lot. They move a lot. Um, I mean, I think weeks ago they were moving hourly. Now it's more like daily. But they move a lot. And it's things like understanding who's who's in charge of doing that and should they be touching that and why are they doing that and things along the line. So kind of communication is key, both between all of the contractors, but also the trickle down to the, to the ARCs as well. I think a lot of discussions and decisions get made at supervisor level and, and above, and the supervisors know what's going on. But if you don't tell the archaeologists that, it's very disruptive to what we're doing. It's very confusing, and it can be quite um, demotivating when you're just kind of just, oh, you're not doing that, now you're going over here, and you don't know why, or you're not told what, or what's happening. So I think it's really good for morale to be kind of have that trickle down. Um, both go down, but also going up as well about sort of innovation. I think innovations that come on site, all sort of things. Like, I think it'd be better if we do this, or sort of changes to, not massive changes to program. That would be mental, um, but just sort of. I it could could we do it this way? Sort of kind of throwing logic at it because it seems to me, and I don't know why, but logic isn't really considered at any point when you get on site. So sometimes just throwing logic back up the loop and kind of getting that agreed. And that's quite empowering for an archaeologist to be able to go to their supervisor and say, would it be better if we did it this way? And that works really well as well. What have I put? Um, yeah, another nice thing about it uh, is that uh, early doors, uh, right from the start, we had designed for us and built for us um, dedicated processing facilities, which I think some people have had a tour of. And if you haven't, should because <laughs> it's there we go and and we were included we were we included from the start about the design of that so exactly what we wanted what we needed and that that was that was built for us with the the processing of of these remains in mind so the shelving units and it runs actually logically for once so we've got there's like four rooms and they run from the dirty room where we bring in the the the, the remains and they're kind of stored through to the, the washing room, the drying room, and then there's the kind of the, the assessment and boxing room. And we go through. And it's a really nice flow, and it's been designed with us in mind. It's as ergonomic as it can be. They've kind of minimised all risks, or sort of reduced risks, and kind of we've really thought about what it is that we're doing. And again, as that's gone on and developed, the processors and the archaeologists have been able to feed back their suggestions, and it's been adapted or amended where possible. But that's kind of, yeah, a really nice, a really nice thing that's been built for us. That is, because we're doing the processing on site, we also, when we find something, I mean, it's all interesting, but when we find something particularly interesting, particularly rare, we get, uh, or weekly we do, um, a skeleton of the week. And that's not just for the archaeologists, which in and of itself is great. We all go in and one of the osteologists will walk us through the particular um, disease or condition or um, just something that's vague. Sorry, interesting about the particular skeleton that, that they processed that we found that they processed and we get a little bit of talk box talk a little bit of cpd every week 20 minutes of just sort of finding out what's going on but that's not just for us that's obviously for the engineers on site for some reason and it might just be that they don't want to go um i've not seen the, the attendance with us um but they would be more than welcome to come through and just see what we've also done a couple of talks about the finds that we found associated with the remains as well so there's automatically kind of feedback to the field team about what they're finding and, and, and anything interesting that they might want to learn about. We're also um, recording things uh, paperlessly. Is that a word? It's a word now. <laughs> We've got a paperless recording system. 
um, which we've been trialling um, since its early inception and doing the evaluation work, so it's got running code now. And although that does have its faults, it is quite it is it is quite nifty. It's quite quick. It's really intuitive. The system. It's based on um, pro forma recording sheets, so it's not a massive leap into something really different. It's just a quicker and easier method of doing something that we're already familiar with. But that will save time down the line because that data will be able to go straight into the database rather than us manually having to input everything and check everything. So, so down the line, I can, you know, they're, they're already on site, but down the line, also there is a significant, well, presumably, I've not checked more personally myself, but presumably there'll be significant reductions in loss of context sheets, ideally. So that's great. Um, in terms of the electric plant, I can see its value, <laughs> but I can't say I'm entirely sold on it. For the simple reason that it's really bulky, so it's you can't get it next to the archaeology. So we're still using bucketing and stuff, and then, and then the, the neighbours and stuff will remove or assist with us um, and to move it elsewhere. There are two types we've been trying, and I really should probably say this up because I'll never be able to talk again. There are two types we've got on site. There's a big truck type, and that looks really nifty. And I can you can always tell the guy the attendants really enjoy those because they can ride on the back, which is obviously really good for morale. And it does move quite a lot of dirt. So I'm fully on board with those over there. There's another stuff, it's just basically they put massive wheels on a really massive wheelbarrow. And they say it's powered. And what they mean by powered is that it's motorised going forwards and back, which is the easiest part of a wheelbarrow. <laughs> it doesn't turn, and it's, and it's massive, so you fill it, but then you have to manually empty it. Don't get them. They don't work. I don't like them. We've also tried, it's not actually been on, um, or within the structure itself. I know when we, they were excavating um, the crypt, which is just outside of the tent on the west side, on the Valley Ridge side. They were using um, an electric digger. And it looked really nifty. It's quite small, so it struggled to move some of the heavier material. The battery didn't last very long, so it actually had to be tied it had to be plugged in a lot. So then you had training cables, which was interesting. But because it's, because it's battery powered, it's really quiet and sneaks up on you. So it does have increased health and safety risks associated with it, just so you know. <laughs> what has been good, because there's so much plants, um, we have done a lot of, and I know it's on the research projects, but there's sort of the red zone training and the thumbs up training. And that has been good for, for a lot of the archaeologists, just be more aware of, of the closeness of the plant, but how it works. And the, a really nice part about that, and I don't know if you've done it, um, you actually get to sit in the machine and not to touch the buttons. <laughs> but yeah, so that's really good. See, so it does give you, it's like, oh, they can't see you from here. It's quite an arbitrary concept. It's like, well, you have to stand in this bit because they can't see you. But actually, when you get in the machine, especially one of the 20 ton machines, and you can't see anything, that is quite scary to go through here. So it does, it does very much bring home the point of don't go into exclusion zones, don't do that stuff. It does the, yeah, um, what did I say about? So we've done the money handing, we've done the tent. The tent's lovely. I'm sure it'll be amazing when it's finished. But I'm really enjoying it. Um, no, it is. It's not. I mean, it's, it's, it was a massive undertaking because it's such a, it's such a large site and you couldn't put a marquee up. Um, and, it, and, it, and it is really good. I do really like it. Um, again, there's uh, condensation issues um, which haven't been addressed. So there are days that are not going Talk again. There are days that you're rained on. It's best not to think about what that is. <laughs> Just to put it out there, there's a thought. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it, it, it works with screens, um, obviously from the public view, which is very important for, for, the, for the human remains, um, but also we shelter from the elements. Uh, which is great because then you didn't get, oh, we can't go out today because it's wet. I mean, no, no one ever says you can't go out because it's wet, so it's like you're going out anyway, but it won't be wet. Well, it will be wet, but not from the sky. Well, it will be wet from the sky, but it won't be what you think it is, so just crack on. <laughs> it's going really well. Uh, what else was I talking about? That's kind of it. I think there are better, yeah, so the, the labourers, the attendants, um, again, have the benefits. They are doing a lot of the ground reduction for us, which is lovely, because no one likes that. Because ultimately, although there are 14,000 people pushing it, 
lots of uh, burials, there is even more clay. London clay. Lovely, lovely London clay. Significant amounts. Many, many, many metric tons of London clay. So they are doing the bulk of the ground reduction, the, the guys themselves, when we are obviously in, in the denser um, burial zones. And then as the burials kind of peak out, we are we obviously assisting us with the smaller um, diggers and we're producing a lot of ground that way, which, again, I think as a London kind of company, I'm kind of used to that happening, that we get machines in as and when we can to do a lot of the bulk digging because, you know, we want to crack, crack on with this stuff. No, but... Uh, so, so it is saving so much time and energy and manpower and broken backs and risks and slips, trips and falls just by using the machinery and stuff. So that's that's really, really helpful and really nice. And I think everybody should definitely do that where possible. And yeah, with the chapter itself is actually having people on site that aren't archaeologists is that has stood right next to you or working alongside you is really nice because you can actually think about what you're doing because they ask you what you're doing. So so you have to think about it and you have to explain it and you have to explain it in such a way that's not really technical, not as though burials are. But but you do you do think about what you're doing and why you're doing it that way and why is that the best way of doing it and actually could you do it better? So you're constantly reflecting on your on your methods and could you do it better and stuff which i think is really nice because we don't do that enough i think there's you know as i've thought i've been tasked with sort of heading up some sort of yeah well field work trainer on this site because i've got, I've got a lot of experience and i guess they think it keeps me out of trouble but it is it's wrong but it but it is quite nice because also the the black hats, so the supervisors from the other companies also come to me to ask if I can keep an eye on their guys and teach their guys how to dig and better ways of digging and more efficient ways of digging and so they don't hurt themselves. So it's quite it's quite nice that, that we can learn things from each other, but because they're there helping us, assisting us, they do make us better at what we do. Which what's what I think. I mean I'm probably wrong. But that's all I've got to say about that. Thank <laughs> you.